Give the gift of thoughtful conversation this holiday season with a membership to the Commonwealth Club. Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial. Thank you for joining us today. Today's program is the second of two featuring the Adachi Project from the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Commonwealth Club is a 118 year old nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to the civil discussion of important issues of the day. Any views expressed are those of the speakers. The Commonwealth Club is producing hundreds of programs a year, even during the pandemic. So head over to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS for all upcoming programs, including our year-end celebration this Friday evening, plus podcasts and video of past events. If you are watching us live on YouTube, use the chat box to submit questions for our special guest today. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Miao, the producer and host of The Michelle Miao Show and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Good to see you again, Michelle. Thank you so much, John, and thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon for this exciting conversation. Today, we welcome back the Adachi Project, a project of the San Francisco Public Defender's Office in partnership with Compound and Even Odd Films, which pays tribute to the late, great Jeff Adachi, who was not only the elected public defender from 2002 to 2019, but who was also an award-winning filmmaker. In April, we showcased one of the Adachi Project's first films, 111 Taylor during a pandemic, which exposed the dangerous conditions at a Tenderloin halfway house run by the private prison corporation Geo Group. Today, we'll be showing another Adachi project film from the inaugural body of work, Defender Volume 00. This film is called From Inside, which features candid conversations with people who were inside San Francisco County Jail in those early and distressing days of the pandemic. Today, we're here to talk to the Adachi Project team, members of the Public Defender's Office, and a community advocate from the Young Women's Freedom Center about the ongoing impact of the pandemic and and how it's having uh, uh, the impact that it's having on uh, those who are accused of crimes, not yet convicted, but subject to some of the same concerning jail conditions as 20 months ago. So let's please welcome San Francisco Public Defender Mano Raju and Santosh Daniel of Compound, a founding partner of the Adachi Project. Um, Welcome everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Let's start with Santosh as one of the founding partners of the Adachi Project. And for those in the audience who aren't familiar with the Adachi Project, can you give us an introduction to today's event? I think we got you on mute, Santosh. Uh, Thank you to Michelle. Thank you for inviting us back for this event. And thank you to the Commonwealth Club for having us uh, once again. We're very happy to be here to present uh, this film. Uh, As you said, uh, my name is Santos Daniel and I am a founding partner with the San Francisco Public Defender's Office and Even Odd Films uh, of the Adachi Project, which is uh, first of its kind documentary media initiative by any US Public Defender Office uh, that launched early this year, uh, following approval by the SF Board of Supervisors. Um, You know, just to recap what the mission is, it's an inspired initiative with a goal, simply put, to rehumanize a criminal legal, uh, rehumanize our legal system that has evolved to inherently dehumanize the people it seeks to represent. And today, from inside the film that you're going to see and that we're going to discuss, which was filmed with individuals inside San Francisco County Jail during the ongoing COVID crisis is a stark portrait of how such things like that happen and sort of why we exist as the Adachi Project. Um, in just a moment, before you watch this film, uh, Mano Rajo, the elected public defender, is going to speak in detail about why we made this film. And after that, you'll also hear from Mohammed Gordistani, who is also a co-founder of the Adachi Project and director of the film itself, as to how we actually made the film. And then, as you said, we'll hear from Ilona Solomon and Julia and Julia Arroyo about how and why the situation you see depicted in the film, which isn't uncommon, happens and how our community is responding. Um, 
Before I head off to Mono, though, I wanted to say, uh, you know, as co-founder of the Adachi Project, one thing that I and we would like our audience to know as you watch this film is that the film itself emulates a real guiding precept of the Adachi Project, which of course is inspired by its namesake, as you said, the late public defender and documentary filmmaker, Jeff Adachi. Um, those of you who knew Jeff and those of you who didn't, uh, you know, he was a fierce advocate of the people, both as an attorney and an artist. And he was driven by an inflexible belief that we should never be content with just telling a story, but that we should always push ourselves to tell the complete story. Uh, today's film, which is presented under the creative identity of Defender, as you cited earlier, which is our inaugural body of work, it doesn't tell you everything about what it's like to go through the carceral system, but it does depict the reality that public defenders witness every day and that we as the public rarely ever see or hear. And it is one of three films that we produce in this, our first year, all of which bring to light details and defining experiences of the criminal legal system that oftentimes are oftentimes alter human life forever. They cripple communities for generations. And ultimately sometimes, you know, harm us in the society that it was designed to protect. And so, in other words, the film that you're seeing today seeks to complete the story as sort of Jeff's, you know, sort of goal that he always had. It seeks to complete the story and public understanding of what's really happening inside our criminal legal system. And our hope in presenting this film is that it inspires you to want to know more and help us do more to create a system that represents all people with equality and empathy so that we don't ever have to encounter a situation as such as what you see in today's film and which Mano is now going to discuss. Yeah, Mano, let's talk about the film and why it was important for the Adachi Project to produce it. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Michelle. It's always great to be, be on your show. Um, you know, From Inside features our clients who were in the San Francisco County Jail during the early days of the pandemic, when we, as their public defenders, were the only people who had access to them, and we wanted them to be heard. In-person jail visits had ceased. Trials had come to a halt. Uh, people were living in congregate living facilities. Um, and were susceptible to the virus. Um, and although this film takes place in the unique context of the pandemic, I mean, this, this phenomenon is evergreen in that there's half a million people trapped in jails across the country every day. And this film speaks to the everyday anxiety that people in jail experience as they're cut off from their work, their families, um, you know, different aspects of what's going on outside of the jails. Um, and in San Francisco, even though the city has returned, maybe not today with all with the rain, but returned to some sense of normalcy and families are gonna get together for the holidays, you know, that's not the condition for those we represent in jail who are still facing a huge backlog due to the speedy trial rights being violated every day because the courts have not moved with the speed that we need them to to ensure people's uh, speedy rights and COVID you know, possesses, you know, um, poses actually a real threat to to life. And the backlog of cases possesses a threat to our client's liberty. And GL is always going to pose a threat to people's well-being and sanity. And, you know, people are aware of the story, a lot of people, of Khalif Browder in New York uh, around 2010, I believe. Um, he was in jail for close to three years for allegedly stealing a backpack and kept on trying to get his right to a trial, kept on trying to assert that right, never got that right. And eventually when he finally was sent to a courtroom, the district attorney dismissed the case because they didn't have evidence that he had committed a crime. And, but the toll of being in jail had a devastating impact on him and his family. And he eventually took his own life. And hopefully in bringing humanity to those we represent, we can, we can avoid a situation with other Khalif Browders, but the situation doesn't even have to be that grave to be to be serious. Um, you know, we represent clients where just to have a chance to see a loved one in court for a couple of minutes, sometimes there's a grandmother bringing someone, pulling kids out of school in Antioch, bringing them all the way to San Francisco, just to have five minutes to look at someone and driving them back. And that grandmother is having to take time off from work that she would otherwise have, and those kids are missing a day of school. And that, that, that has an impact. And also the impact is that the reality is people end up pleading to things that they shouldn't 
because they simply cannot get their right to show that they're not guilty of the charges that they're facing. Um, so this is a story that we wanted to be out there. And, you know, the purpose, one of the, the um, themes of the Adachi project is demand, just, demand justice and reveal, reveal truth. And this is an aspect of truth that a lot of people don't really have a window to, and we wanted to show that in this film. All right, without further ado, I think we should play the film for our audience today. And so let's get that film ready. And since the COVID-19, um, things have changed a whole lot. How? I don't even know where to begin. They dehumanize us while we're incarcerated. And with this pandemic going on, there's no hope for us. There's no hope for us. any type of information on what's going on with the COVID-19. We ain't that spreading part. I mean, how, how far is the closest bunk to you? Ten foot away. They're really not taking the precaution that they should with us inmates, because that's what they look at us like, just numbers. Now they have it to where you don't have to Take the COVID-19 test, you can refuse it. So they're not even make you get, making you get tested. You get no yard. You don't get to even shoot a basketball, you know, hit a push-up. You got to do all that inside your room that's smaller than, you know, I don't know. It's smaller than my bathroom at home with two people in it. Can't go to the gym, can't move around, just stuck in a tank with a bunch of people, can't see your family. I just want to be with my family. You know, you never know what's going to happen. This, this thing changes by the minute. Like my mom has cancer, so she's been having cancer for a long time, so it's just not safe for her to come. And I'm getting ready. May, I may be getting sentenced soon. If I can have my family in the pews, and that makes a big impact on the judge. But since they're not allowed to come to court, it's just, it's just me, my lawyer, the DA and the judge is kind of making a colder situation. There's not a lot of love in there. There's not a lot of love. There's not a lot of love. There's not a lot of love. And that's not easy on a mental mind state to sit in anyone's room. I mean, if you do that to a dog, they consider you an animal cruelty. You know, and you go to jail for that. So, you know, to do it to a person is, is really wrong. I don't even know where to begin. It has given me a lot of anxieties and it has made me really want to do everything I can to try to get out of this. COVID-19. COVID-19. If they feel like conducting court, they will conduct it. If they do not feel like conducting court, and that's just part of their procedure for now. So my hearings is April 13th, I believe. And now I just found out I won't be going until June, maybe, you know, and that's not even a for show. A lot of people are not going to our hearings, so we're just stuck in a limbo. We are always going to be in a red Always. It's, it's, it's the design that way. It's the design that way. That's the sad part about it, is that you're guilty, and then you have to prove that you're innocent. How do you not feel a certain type of way? 
I mean, you've been treated a certain type of way. So I can get treated wrong, but I can't show it. Because if I show it, it's, I told you. I told you. Let, yeah, we have a place for him. I told you he had that in him. And it's terrible the way that we've been treated. I've come to understand that there's nothing you can do about it. very powerful short film right there with so many stories that uh, obviously we need to have the platform in which the Adachi project has done for us to tell these stories. And so let me briefly introduce all of you to our panel today. We have Mohammed Gorgistani, who's a filmmaker for the Adachi project, a partner from Even Odd Films. We have Alona Solomon, who's an attorney and also our deputy public defender for San Francisco and Julia Arroyo, who is the managing director at the Young Women's Freedom Center, and Carolyn Jijong Goosen, who's a local policy director for the San Francisco Public Defender's Office and a core member of the Adachi Project. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for, for the film, for the project, for the, the work that you do. Why don't we start with Mohammed? Um, obviously, as you know, someone uh, watching, we know right away you see it, the distortions of the graphic that really steps outside of the traditional documentary uh, making. And so why don't you um, talk about you know, that, that unsettling feeling that we might be feeling from watching uh, the documentary, why you presented it in this way. And as a filmmaker, can you talk about why some of these specific creative choices were made to tell this story? Shell, thanks for um, having me and thanks for having us back again. Um, I think the kind of the, the idea behind, you know, representing the story in this kind of aesthetic and, um, visual language was kind of two parts, but the main part is to kind of, um, try to deliver a little bit more of the, um, of the feeling and emotion that I think the, um, individuals in the film were expressing and talking about and trying to bring that um, a little bit more to life visually. Um, and just this idea that, you know, they were, in my opinion, they were kind of giving you information and insight that uh, I almost feel like you're not supposed to hear because that's not the narrative that people want to kind of paint um, the pandemic around and there was almost like there was some sort of I remember the some of the conversations I was having with like the motion graphics team and our designers and our sound designers and our and our composer was like this idea that someone's almost like hacking into the system to deliver this information um, and using that to using that as like the as the place where we began to kind of distort um, and add kind of like this very digital systematic kind of like layer on top of the film. Um, and I think also for me, there was also as someone like, you know, one of the big things about this project creatively um, has been about making things in a kind of a new language and a new aesthetic that kind of uh, is two, there's two parts to that. One, I'm really interested in bringing in collaborators that have been usually left out of making uh, films or journalism uh, in the subject matter um, that we're dealing with, because so much of like this discourse is rooted in kind of like traditional journalism, which is great. And there's a service for that um, to our community. But I think there's so many people left out just from a 
the sense that a lot of artists or collaborators that I work with don't they don't come from uh, institutional education or backgrounds. They're, they're kind of more people who have dissented their way through life and have found the arts to kind of express themselves. But so it's really great for me to bring in talented designers and artists and motion graphics teams that I collaborate with to suddenly through the through the immersion of working on this project, the osmosis that it naturally creates, suddenly they become advocates inside of their community too for this kind of subject matter that traditionally they were left out uh, on. So uh, I'm really passionate about getting the creative community to create stuff in a new language because I think that will be kind of a way we can kind of um, empower a very kind of new generation to be advocates for this kind of work. And also on the flip, it's like, it's also delivering this information in a, in a style and language that is a little bit more born from the communities that it represents rather than from kind of like an outside in uh, academic or overly kind of like um, studious perspective that I think, again, I, I appreciate that kind of journalism, but I think this doing something new and fresh, um, I think brings in an audience that has traditionally been kind of left out. Just curious, was it the same kind of unsettling feeling that the viewers have that you had while you were putting the film together? Um, I think, I think, um, yes, I definitely, you know, I think COVID had a huge impact on everyone, but I remember being particularly disturbed a little bit about how um, free citizens were kind of referring to the experience of coronavirus and quarantine as like feeling like they're prison, they're in prison at home. And I just remember thinking how ridiculous that was um, because the contrast I had was working on this project and kind of really understanding what people were going through. And, um, but yeah, I mean, when you go through um, this kind of material, I think it's hard, but I think, you know, I'm someone that's done this a long time. So I'm able to like compartmentalize that, I think a little bit more than maybe the average person, just because I have to do that to be able to execute and do the job I need to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I actually haven't watched this film in a, in a couple of weeks. So just even experiencing it now a few minutes ago, I think it just reminded me of like how much work we have to do as a community and we can't cherry pick who we decide are the citizens and residents of the city that deserve to, you know, have, uh, you know, uh, freedom or justice or whatever, um, especially kind of in the current climate of San Francisco. I think we're cherry picking who, uh, who is an actual resident of the city and who is not. And I think all of these individuals are residents. And it's really important to understand that they, um, they have only been charged, not, they have not been found guilty of anything. And you know, it's unconstitutional what's happening. Um, and I think every American um, should be very upset about that. Absolutely. It's a great segue to the second question for Alona. You know, what's it been like to defend your clients uh, who've been in custody since the pandemic? It's been incredibly stressful to be an attorney during the pandemic. One of the individuals in the film uh, was my client. Uh, and I think that she said, she explained a lot about the stress uh, that they're all going through as far as, um, and the conditions are so much worse than they were even before the pandemic. Um, the lack of visitation from families, they still don't have visits um, in any systematic way. There are Zoom visits for certain people. There are extremely limited number and the waiting list is forever. I can't even go see my clients anytime I want to. So my attorney client relationships have suffered as a result. I can't just walk across the street and go visit someone. There's only one room. It's through glass on a recorded phone line, or it says it's recorded, which um, is not the greatest way to start an attorney-client relationship. Um, waiting for Zoom calls for several days for a new client is really difficult. Uh, in addition, there's just, um, there's been 23-hour lockdowns. Uh, they're not getting programming. They're not getting all of the services that they used to get, which were already not enough and not the best, now they're not even getting those. Um, and for my clients, it's tremendously stressful because um, they, they lose, they lose their jobs, they lose their families. Um, they can't 
uh, I have a client now who is going to lose his business because he is detained without bail, even though he is presumed innocent and he has not been convicted of anything. The backlog is outrageous. The fact that uh, we, we have um, 451 people were past their trial deadline. There's their right to a speedy trial has been violated. 218 of those people being in jail. And the fact that 54% of them are African-American in a city that is only 5.6% African-American is, is worse than Ferguson, Missouri. We need to be really concerned about this. Um, as an example, uh, one of the first cases, new cases I got during the pandemic uh, early on was uh, occurred April 12th of 2020 was when the incident occurred. And uh, we asked for a speedy trial. My client's right to a speedy trial was supposed to be no later than January 15th, 2021. And we didn't start our trial until June 28th. So that was six months, um, six months after his speedy trial right was violated. Uh, he got his day in court. So the fact that we're, we're people are losing so much and are suffering so much and their rights are being systematically violated, it's been a lot more challenging to um, to do the best I can for them and to see how they're suffering. Sounds um, horrible. It sounds like, a, you know, in addition to the public health crisis that we're all facing today, a question for Julia, or I'm sorry, Julia. One of the points that the Adachi Project and the Public Defender's Office is emphasizing is that people in jail are members of our community and that the film we saw today tells a story that goes beyond the pandemic. Can you first tell us about who and what the Young Women's Freedom Center is and what kind of experiences justice-involved people have had both before and during the pandemic? Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, let me tell you a little bit about how the organization started in 1993. Um, uh, a lady by the name of Rachel Pfeiffer was doing her dissertation on uh, women and girls living and surviving on the streets of San Francisco. And one of the things that she did was um, train them in community health work. And um, so they were going out and doing outreach, right? But one of the things that she discovered is they were living and surviving every day on their own, taking care of themselves, figuring out places to live. And uh, eventually she left the organization to those um, several young women. And um, Latifa Simon at the time became the youngest executive director in the nation at the age of 19. And the like deputy director was like 17. So it was like very untraditional in the sense, but this was right in the midst of the um, uh, crack, crack epidemic, AIDS, AIDS epidemic, and all of these things were happening, right? And uh, these women, these young women went on to run the organization and keep the same model. And what it does is create this economic opportunity for uh, folks that have lived and survived um, the streets and poverty and uh, lived in San Francisco. And now that we're much bigger and have expanded, uh, but through the years, we had discovered that our folks were kind of getting locked up too, right? And um, I could just talk a little bit about my experience coming through the organization as a 15-year-old, um, actually being inside of Juvenile Hall. And they came inside to do uh, outreach on the inside. And it wasn't in a sense to, um, it was a very untraditional because there was a lot of programs that were coming on the inside, but it was actually peer leaders that were coming back to uh, bring other youth leaders and build, bring them out. So um, with that being said, we um, also work inside of San Francisco County Jail um, and we provide uh, critical thinking workshops, systems navigation. Uh, we do participatory defense too to uh, support lawyers and building uh, social biographies to be uh, able to support, to tell the story of kind of what's happening. Um, but fast forwarding to the pandemic, uh, right at the height of it, I remember um, getting the information and um, it was right away our groups were interrupted on the inside. And I just want to say that San Francisco is enriched in programs, right? 
we have like over 2000 programs inside of San Francisco. And really it's a, um, if supported to be able to know where these resources are and to be able to get the information to the inside, it makes it for, um, oh, not so difficult transition to the outside, but the, but at the time at the pandemic, our clearances were all pulled, right? Everybody couldn't, nobody could go inside of the jail. And so immediately we um, we did a mail-in um, to start uh, communicating through mail with people. And what we learned is that folks were not having access to PPE. And um, I know the, the young man inside of the video had stated that there's no roof access for people to have um, access to be able to to feel air or the sun on your face or anything. Well, actually that's even beyond the pandemic because that's actually a violation of Title 15. However, the, the Sheriff's Department chooses to pay a fine every year instead of providing outdoor access to um, the people that are inside of the facility. So that's just, it's basically the same air circulating around inside of the facility, which everybody's very aware of that there isn't outdoor access or, or you can't feel wind or sun. And I think that's one thing that people even stated inside of a lot of the spaces when we would uh, have circle on the inside is, I haven't felt the sun. I haven't felt the sun on my face. I haven't felt the wind. And um, it's just to give you a little bit of, of what the experience is like on the inside. Um, uh, and then I'll just um, talk about, um, I remember at the time um, even having to get our organization, um, our plan together for how we were responding to the pandemic. And we opened up an emergency hotel uh, to be able to support um, women, transgender uh, men and boys and gender nonconforming people to be able to have a, a safe transfer in. And there were people that were backlogged that we were ongoingly trying to support. Um, just to give a, a little bit of context for some folks that were getting out in the midst of the pandemic, um, I supported a 19-year-old. I um, showed up at the jail, waited for her for hours for her to be able to get out. Um, there was nowhere for her to go. She didn't have an ID. She didn't have a social security card. All of those things were closed. And the only thing that she had was the streets, that was it. There was nothing else that for this young person to be able to get that was also a foster youth that was um, uh, supposed to be given aftercare support and nobody could give her the rapid response at the time or be able to give her um, any of, she couldn't even prove her identity. So um, that's just a little bit of, uh, what uh, the Young Women's Freedom Center was doing, doing during the pandemic, but we were able to um, support 40 survivors of domestic violence and, um, and folks that were, um, uh, who who's, uh, were getting out of the, the jails and long-term sentences as well. So we were able to serve 18 and up, and that was something that uh, we were able to do. It's incredible the kind of work that uh, you know Julia does, and many, many, many members of our community. But Carolyn, you know, the big question for you is from a citywide perspective: What are some of the things that we can do about this problem? Thank you, Michelle, and thank you so much for having us in your show again. Um, you know, what's so critical right now is that we bring light onto this issue. It's too often that folks, once they're in jail, once they're locked up, other people on the outside, other than their families and friends don't know what's going on. And we're not talking about it in the press. We don't hear about what are the conditions in the jails um, and the fact that we have presumptively innocent people who are lingering in there. Um, and so we were really glad to see that on December 2nd, Supervisor Hillary Ronan, who represents the mission and Bernal, held a hearing um, on the situation in the courts and introduced a resolution that will be voted on tomorrow at the Board of Supervisors that calls on the courts to open more courtrooms and to prioritize criminal over civil trials. Now we hear about criminal or civil trials 
in the press, but the reality is civil trials, people are not incarcerated waiting for the civil trial to happen. And in criminal cases, even if there is no case, people are waiting in jail. We have a, a, a lawyer who talks about how her client was held in jail over a year and the jury deliberated in less than two hours, that person was found not guilty in all on all, all charges. It was not a real case against that person. And, that, and yet their whole life was upended by being away from family, job, your housing, everything is put at risk, right? When you're suddenly put away, you're not able to contact folks, you can't see people in person. And so, you know, we're really glad to see that city leaders are really taking this on now um, and are understanding and moving on the fact that this is a real human rights issue in San Francisco. Um, again, that we don't hear about. We hear a lot right now about, um, you know, what's happening to, you know, luxury items in the stores. We don't hear about what's happening to hundreds of people whose lives are upended and who are suffering in the jails. And so, you know, the, um, what the city leaders are talking about is working with the courts, working with the sheriffs to, and working with other city agencies to use the resources um, that we have in the city to find other courts, to staff them so folks can move more quickly through, get their trial, and then many times just get to go home for the many folks where, who end up being found not guilty and they can just leave. Um, right now, the jails are at the highest number they've been since COVID started. Today, I believe is 892 people in the jails. And a lot of the reasons that those numbers are so high is because of this backlog. And because it's so backed up, people aren't able to go through the system the way they're supposed to. Um, so, you know, I think we're, we're really grateful to have the opportunity to just bring this issue forward, make people aware of it, um, remind folks that these are our community members and to push the city leaders to use the resources of our incredibly wealthy city to really you know, be nimble, be creative and find a way to address this crisis. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, I wanted to go back to Alona you know, and something also that Mano brought up, he had given an example of an extreme case of what has happened to someone you know, who was found not guilty and ended up uh, losing his life. And then Alona, you had described what it's been like to defend, you know, your clients. I mean, can we have an open discussion to really bring more, more specifics, more depth to what truly happens when we violate human rights in this way? What, if we don't address the backlog and we don't do it very fast, I would imagine just from, you know, watching the film today and listening to you all that there will be more deaths. Yes, thank you. I, I completely agree. I think that uh, considering the conditions in the jail, I think that it's safe to say that people's health is suffering. Uh, one of my clients um, in the video gained over 100 pounds in the time that she was in uh, the county jail. The food is terrible. It's not healthy. They don't get any physical activity. If they're not receiving uh, mental health treatment, all of these things are going to make their lives shorter. It is going to make, um, it is going to harm physical and mental health long-term to keep people in custody in this way. And uh, my clients now, uh, when, when they come to court and say, I want my speedy trial, when am I gonna get the, when am I gonna get my trial? And I have to tell them, I don't know. I, I, you're entitled to a trial by January 30th. Uh, that's when they have to start your trial, but it's gonna get continued. And I hope we can get your trial done in the summertime, but I don't know. And every day is a struggle uh, for those clients because they're not getting what they need. They're far away from family. Um, you know, one of my clients, his dog just had a, a litter of, of puppies and uh, he, was, he was really sad that he doesn't get to be there and help take care of them. So every little thing that we take for granted in our lives, the things that we're able to do, and I love the discussion about feeling the sun on your face or the wind in your face. It's so true. These little things that we take for granted um, that keep us alive and sane and healthy uh, are things that my clients are being denied. And it's just, it's devastating that uh, this is all being done at the expense of their their right to a speedy trial under the California and the United States Constitution. And the, another additional question for you, Carolyn, you'd mentioned Supervisor Hillary Ronan, and it feels like, you know, there's something being done, but um, are there more people 
uh, from the city that should be really paying attention, should be doing something that we should be making noise to, just feels like there, there are uh, other folks that really need to throw their names in the hat in making sure that we deal with this situation. No, absolutely. I think um, making all levels of our representatives aware that this is an issue that you care about, um, that is important to San Franciscans, is, is critical in having this move forward. So all of the members of the Board of Supervisors, the Mayor, Assembly Member Phil Ting, Senator Scott Weiner, um, these are all folks who have um, the power to really push for change, to push for the shifting of resources. Our state budget, we're looking at a $31 billion um, surplus in the following year for the state. Our city has a $13 billion budget. So, you know, we, we have the resources, we need the political will. Um, and I think absolutely, please get in touch for folks who are watching with your elected officials to push them to really make sure that we are prioritizing our, our invisibilized um, and very vulnerable folks who are, who are in jail right now needlessly, illegally past the deadline. And just this is the uh, second film we had mentioned that we um, showed from the Adachi project. And so obviously the, these films are very important in telling stories, especially from folks, you know, who like we saw in the film feel very alone, very isolated, feel like there's no hope. And so I'd love for each and every single one of you to answer the question of, what you want people to take away from the film and uh, especially, you know, films from the Adachi project. So we'll start with Mohammed. Um, it's a great question. There's a lot of things to take away. I think um, as someone who's also a resident in San Francisco, I've been here a long time. I think, um, you know, something that Mano said earlier really struck with me, which was, um, you know, this idea that you got to tell the whole story. And I think right now, um, this city is under a bit of an attack in terms of forgetting that, you know, our biggest duty as a community and as a society is to protect and uplift the most vulnerable members of our communities. Um, and I think we are selectively picking who is a member of San Francisco resident. We hear a lot of things around save our city um, my question to that is, um, whose city? <laughs> um, and I think when you, you see people who are in this film, that's not the whole picture. I mean, you have their families involved. The, the, the ripple of the things that um, happen when our system continuously is not overhauled and continues to fail people is, um, it makes everyone's life worse. And I think we've seen the whole tough on crime, war on drugs kind of legacies of the 90s and the outcome of that. And I think we're teetering on San Francisco returning to some of those things. And you hear the dog whistles every day in the media um, and on Twitter and other places. And I think people have to, hopefully a film like this allows people to reconsider the totality of what's going on. Um, and that's, that's kind of our main goal with this project. Julia. Yes, um, one of the things I was going to put in the chat for the moderator, maybe they could share, but um, we also, a piece of our work is doing, um, we do participatory action research, so the folks that are directly impacted get the skills to be able to come back, collect information, and um, uh, they're certified as principal researchers too, so the information is valid and we try to present our findings to the Board of Supervisors to impact like some of their decision making and um, because we believe that a lot of the so solutions that we're trying to create should be guided and informed by those directly impacted so we don't create something that um, the community isn't asking for. And I really like how we are, um, I just want to echo the piece of like, which part of San Francisco. Um, and even thinking about back to my experience too, um, I was born in San Francisco. I'm um, four generations in on my mother's side. So I can look around San Francisco and say, you know, my uncle built this, you know, like my, my mother had a part in this piece of it. And so when I'm thinking about the next generation of my family, 
continuing to build in San Francisco, which I hear a lot of these historical roots for folks that are coming out of Bayview, Hunters Point, the Fillmore District, all of the, the places that are disproportionately impacted by incarceration and over-policing, um, those are the, the community that I would just want to uh, uplift inside of this space right now. And even, even the Tenderloin, in the midst of so much chaos, there's just so much beauty and historic roots that come from a lot of our community there. And if we could just look a little bit deeper, um, one of the reports that I just put out was through their eyes. We um, collected uh, life maps from over 100 uh, incarcerated people that have been involved in the juvenile system here in San Francisco and the adult system. So we can uh, begin to kind of hear from, from those stories if you um, want to continue um, hearing more about this. Ilona. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think that my favorite thing about the film and the takeaway that I would want people to understand is that uh, very few people get what I get every day, my privilege, the privilege to uh, sit across the table and look in the eyes of my clients and to see them as the people that they are, the full people, and to accept them and to understand them and to listen to them and to be to be there. And uh, and it is really easy for the world, society, social media, the media to dehumanize our clients and say, oh, the guy who did such and such, oh, the person who robbed this store or the person who shot this person. I like to think that we are more than the sum of the worst day of our lives. I like to think that all people are, uh, all we're all human and we all have flaws and but for the grace of God go I that I don't suffer from a severe mental health problem, that I don't have, that, uh, that I'm not from a community that didn't have any opportunity for me to become where I am today and sit across the table from someone sitting in orange, um, locked up for something. And this film, what's so beautiful about it is it, you, you get to do what I get to do every day, which is you get to look into their eyes and you get to hear their voices and you get to um, see them as humans. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. And I hope that that is what people take away. Carolyn. Um, I love what everyone has said um, before me. I, I think the only thing I would add is, you know, as, as everyone said earlier, you know, we get to hear the voices of folks themselves who are being put through this system. And when you read so many news articles or watch, um, you know, news episodes about what's happening on the streets of San Francisco right now, you never get to hear from from folks who are being accused of things. You never get to hear from public defenders or amazing community advocates or formerly incarcerated people um, from that perspective. And so just you know, to reflect on that, think, okay, we're constantly hearing from police, we're constantly hearing from either a law enforcement or business person perspective, especially right now, we're not getting the full side of the story. And on the other side, our, our brothers, our, you know, our fathers, our community members who are taking care of their elderly parents, our beautiful people who are full people. And to just keep that in mind um, because this is what's happening to our community members right now. Thank you. I see Manel is on with us and um, I know that it's off script, but I, I do think that it's a perfect question for you really you know, what you want people to take away from the film, as well as the Adachi project in general? Well, I think, um, thank you for the question. You know, what one thing that resonates for me with the film is just the interconnectedness of, of all of this and, and of our clients. I mean, you hear that one uh, gentleman, you know, more concerned about his mother potentially getting sick from having to visit him and the pain his mother was going through from not being able to visit him, right? And you know, I've been in hearings where I have a client, you know, really important motion that could dramatically impact a, a case that's where someone's facing a life sentence. And you know, he comes up to me, but he's made these two beautiful um, Valentine's Day cards for his daughter. And he really wants to make sure, did you get her these cards or not? Like, the, or did you get the cards to the relative that's coming to court so they can get them? He's more concerned about that and the impact on 
his loved one than even in his own life. And I think for people to fully understand the beauty of that, um, which we, as Alona said, we have the, the, the privilege of being able to see uh, that beauty of the humanity of our clients and their interconnectedness. And we like to talk about not just client-centered representation, but fam-centered representation, because we know the impact on that individual is gonna have an impact on their entire family, however they define family, and maybe even generationally. I think for people to understand that and to really think before they jump at the latest thing that someone tweets and think this is the policy that needs to be implemented, to think a little bit deeper at the full humanity of the people we represent is what I hope people uh, draw from this film. Santosh, would you like to also add your thoughts on uh, you know, the takeaway of the film and the Adachi project altogether? I, <laughs> I think everyone has said, uh, probably more than I could ever think to say, because I think they've all hit, hit it right on the head of, um, there's so many things we want people to take away from these films. And I think one of the things, probably the, the overarching thing to remember is that the narratives that we've heard about the system, the criminal legal system, and the people that are in it have been very one-sided and limited and told with extreme prejudice. And something like the Adachi Project and the people that are here on this panel here today, are, are, are around to remind everybody that there isn't just one narrative and that, that whatever narratives that's been put out there for years hasn't been working because we've only gone backwards and in the wrong direction. And it is time for us to put new narratives like this, include more voices and listen to other stories because there can't just be one way and one voice that dictates what the system is going to be and how it's gonna affect us because it's meant to ultimately protect us, not hurt us the way it is doing right now. And so everything that everybody said is very powerful. And I think that's the only thing that I would say is that we're here constantly sort of reminding people that there's, there's always another story that you're not hearing when you hear the story that comes out in popular media or from the courts or from, you know, even from prosecutors. And so, um, so just remember that. Yeah, thank you all so much for all your thoughts. We actually have a few minutes left. And so I'm gonna throw in a wild card question and anyone can add thoughts to it. You know, I personally, uh, what's been what's been difficult um, is been has been right. We're all sure some of us are working from home, or some of us are not out there doing our daily things. Some of us are incredibly isolated, and um, the narratives, the conversations that we're having with one another, I find it through a very divisive political time that we are facing, whether yesterday or today has really uh, contributed to the deterioration of trust within one another, in which then I feel as if that has a really horrible impact on our communities, our society. And so if anyone would like to jump in and share, maybe even, you know, whether personally or professionally for you, how you really re try to reach out to community to, to build back, you know, a little bit of that trust and give, us all hope that we don't necessarily always have to be so extreme or, or divided on certain things. We The important thing is we need to come together. Um, I'd love to hear from that. I think Julia, you would be a perfect person to, to hear from um, and just hearing some of your stories and showing up for a 19 year old woman. So share with us, you know, how you might uh, put yourself out there to rebuild trust in our community. Um, I would say that the most sacred place that everybody has is their kitchen table. That is the most place, that's the place where you can just have, especially for folks that um, I know coming back to uh, even my father and my stepmother, you know, that table is a place where we have conversations and discourse and disagreement and I and I push back against ideas and beliefs and they push me too and I think that those are the um that's our kind of heart of where it is but um building back trust in our community I would say that um that uh just being able to, you know, what keeps me going in this is being able to see folks push through um, a lot of the hardships, the things that are designed to not always 
make them successful in the end to like keep persevering and push through that and um, hold on because sometimes the work that and the sacrifice that the Young Women's Freedom Center is doing, sometimes they won't be able to reap the benefits of it. Sometimes it'll be for the next generation, just like when um, the youth organizers came together, collected all this research in the community, and a lot of them had spent their whole childhoods inside of jail. And so um, they didn't get to reap the benefits of their work, but knowing that something that they're doing today is actually gonna spread for the next generation to not have to have such a, um, a punitive, approach, but more one that has uh, is about community health and wellness and success and creating communities where folks thrive. So beautiful. Anyone else want to add to sharing some thoughts on rebuilding trust in our community? I'll say something. Um, I, I've heard people I've heard lots of people tell me, oh, I don't feel safe in San Francisco, or when I walk down the street, I feel uncomfortable. And the thing that I always say, because I live on a block where um, there are a lot of uh, services for uh, home, uh, houseless individuals and people who need help in the community. And uh, sometimes there are people screaming, sometimes there are people um, doing things on my block. And I always uh, find that when you make eye contact with somebody and you say good morning, uh, you'd be shocked at how much of a connection you can make and how just that little um, connection, that little uh, acknowledgement of someone's humanity is how you get to see the, uh, how you get to see other people's perspectives is, and how you can also feel better and safer in your own space. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. The only other thing that I would add that I think is sort of interesting is, um, the idea of seeing other people's perspectives on a jury. I, I think it's incredible that in our day and age, we can get 12 people to agree on anything in, in their room, 12 strangers. It's unbelievable that not every jury trial ends in a, in a hung jury. So it is possible to see other people's perspectives. It is possible to connect. You just have to open your mind and make eye contact and say good morning sometimes. I love that. Anyone else? Mohammed? Um, I mean, I can share maybe kind of just, it's a really good question. Um, and I think something that, you know, I can actually do more thinking around too. Um, but what came to mind for me is, um, I think to get to anywhere where we want to go, we have to consider some of the steps almost like a, uh, a practice, you know, and we have to be very intentional into continuing to um, place ourselves into the perspective of other people. Um, I think films is one way of doing it, but the danger there is if you only do it through films, uh, you'll have a sentimental relationship to something and you have to earn those feelings that you initially feel. You have to earn them by, uh, in my opinion, whether it's saying good morning to someone that you traditionally maybe wouldn't, um, going to parts of the community that you only read about. Um, you know, one thing. I've done in San Francisco as long as I've been here is like whenever I've looked for an apartment, I've tried to maintain some proximity to, um, to a transitional housing facility. Um, I currently live next to one. And I think that just for me has been a way I can be in proximity to people who keep me, keep me in line, you know, spiritually and um, provide me perspective. And I think for me, that's another reason that I became as a, filmmaker interested in someone like Jeff Adachi because it was another individual and service that the city has in the public defender's office that again I, at some point I didn't know any of this stuff either you know and I think it's important to think about it like a practice and you have to build a routine and you have to build processes in your life that allow you to um, fill in your blind spots and add light to the shadows that you might have um, because we're all just human anyway and that are, it's natural to do that. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more thought before we conclude our program today. Building back trust. Well, I certainly think that you know, the types of films, uh, the work that the public defender is doing as well as the Adachi Project is obviously doing that. 
And so I thank you all so much for being with us today. Mano, did you have some last words to add? I think we only, I, I just wanted to say a couple, two words actually, just to remain curious. So I think yeah. Remain curious, a lot flows from that. Absolutely. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today for this very special program. Again, it's the second installment that we've worked with the Public Defender's Office and the Adachi Project. So if you'd like to watch all of the films, you can head to wearedefender.com. Please support the project and the work that they do. Head to adachiproject.com. We'll see you all soon. Thank you so much to all of our speakers, Santosh Daniel, Manu uh, Raju, Alona Solomon, Mohammed Gorgistani, Carolyn Goosen and Julia Arroyo. And uh, thanks again. Don't forget, our very last program is this Friday. So RSVP, you can head to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. And thank you to the Commonwealth Club of California for providing us the platform to have this very important discussion today. We'll see you next time. <laughs>